I'm in the living history section here at Tankfest at Bovington, and there are loads of reenactors reenacting all sorts of uh, generally Second World War themes. And uh, here we have Haya Safari, and they do the, uh, the, the, the Africa Corps, so the German troops who fought in Africa in the desert in World War II. And this chap here, if I jump down and uh, join you, you have a very interesting looking gun here. Uh, I recognize this as a squeeze bore anti tank gun. Uh, what's its uh, official name? It's a Panzerbusch 41 STV 41B. B? B. Is that better than the A? I think it's because it's got a lighter carriage. So could you explain the, the squeeze bore and what that's all about? Right, it starts off at 2.8 centimetres and as it goes down the, down the barrel, it squeezes those collars down on the side down to 2 centimetres. So it increases the pressure that you can get behind a smaller cartridge and it's coming out at a much higher velocity and down the middle you've got the tungsten carbide penetrator that does the actual penetrating through the tank right so what you've got is a very hard spike that goes extremely fast so it won't put a hole in the moon but it'll put it'll a hole put in the hole tank in most tanks okay but not a very big hole not a very big hole but if it comes through the wall of the tank it might upset you Yes, it could, it could ruin your whole afternoon. How would you know how far away the enemy is? We'd use a rangefinder. A rangefinder? You happen to have one? I do, just over there. How tremendously convenient. This is an EM34 rangefinder that uses two optics on either, either side of the, uh, the pole mm -hmm. and you adjust the, the uh, prisms to down so you get the, uh, the, vi the image, the two images. Yep. When they, when they cross in the middle mm -hmm. and they're in, in focus, you then you read off the range off the marker there on the right hand side. So and you'll tell the, tell the gunner that's the range. So just as I can tell roughly how far away something is because I've got two eyes that are yeah. at a distance between them and my, my brain works out the triangulation, this is a way of getting your eyes much further apart so you have a much wider yeah. base on, your, on that 80 triangle. 80 centimeter. Right. So it's actually you're doing the same sort of job as, as a pair of eyes on, on a predator looking for prey. But a little bit more accurately yeah. with German technology. With, but there were uh, range find, other rangefinders were available. Right, so this, the, this was the, the commonest weapon that uh, would be used by German infantrymen in World War II. Yes. Uh, but the one that you tend to see in films a lot is this one, which is yes. often misnamed, I believe, the Schmeisser. Yes. The MP40 or 38. Uh, yes, in, that's an MP40, that one, um, mm -hmm. as you rightly say, because uh, I think some of the magazines had the word Schmeiser stamped on them. And that's how the nickname came about. Of course, it's, uh, it's a much more Hollywood-esque type weapon, firing a lot of bullets rapidly, um, although not as many uh, without reloading as you might see in the film. Well, I, I remember in, in, in was it Where Eagles Dare that yes. Clint Eastwood f fired about 947,000 rounds without ever having to reload. Yes. And none of them missed, as I, I seem to remember. That's right. So in the movie, they would, they'd be holding it like this, which is completely incorrect. Oh, don't hold it by the end of the magazine. Exactly. Uh, That's madness. So, so uh, obviously there was a slight bit of give, and, and if you did that, um, basically with the recoil of the gun, it would jam. So, uh, mm -hmm. so um, best to hold it like that, with a well. Surrender. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now I noticed that you're all sporting uh, quite a collection of medals here. Uh, so, what, uh, sir, what are you with your three medals there? Uh, I've got an early sports badge or sports award. And that tells us that you're pretty good at running and jumping. Um, I do go running every day, so that's kind of why I, 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 I wear this on my uh, <laughs> right. tunic. So it's like a sort of semi-awarded it myself. But yeah, okay. that's an early, early version of the uh, sports award. And your scarf here—that looks quite civilian, it quite is casual. Very civilian, uh, very. Very uh, casual. Um, obviously, you didn't get a lot of posts out being in North Africa, so mm -hmm. that come, uh, to us would, would have come from home. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, lovely girlfriend would have sent me this nice silk scarf to help with the heat in the desert. Right. Um, it'd have been very useful. I'd have tied it over my nostrils during the time of the sandstorm over my mouth. And right. I'd put it in uh, water if there was any available to wear around my neck to keep me cool. So, uh, yeah, it's very nice. It's very light. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's very, very good of her. Very good gift. It, 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 it's a successful she's gift. She's lovely. Right, yeah. what's her name? Uh, her name's Nadine, and she's behind you. Standing chair, okay, so. Nadine, successful gift. <laughs> yeah. Now, there are many uh, units that you could choose to, to reenact, yep. uh, and you are all quite clearly British, and it's not always you know, fiercely sunny in Britain. Uh, this, is, this is a fact. Um, so, why did you pick the Africa Corps to reenact? 
Well, the honest answer is for me, uh, it goes back to when I was a child. I used to have uh, airfix soldiers and Britain soldiers. There's always Africa Corps. Uh, my grandfather fought in North Africa. Right. I remember his uh, tales. Um, I used to have to try and extract stories out of him that he fought in North Africa for two years. Mm -hmm. And I remember being fascinated by him at an early age. So it's just something I've just been into for, yeah, for, for goodness knows how long. So um, I collect Africa Corps items. Right. Um, just something I've always wanted to do. So it's, so you're, you're fascinated by the war in the desert in yeah, North Africa yeah, yeah, in more, the period? More so than the war in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. Both my grandfathers fought in World War II. They, uh, one fought in North Africa and Burma, and the other uh, grandfather just fought in Burma. None of them ever fought in, in mainland Europe. Um, people kind of forget that. Everyone right. thinks of World War II perhaps being in France, Belgium, and of course in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of British guys, it was North Africa and the Far East. So um, you know, I'm happy to sort of pass on. Right. But there are lots of units that fought in, in uh, North Africa, Anzacs and Sikhs and so forth. Yeah, I think, that's, again, I think it's a, with the German stuff, I just like wearing shorts sometimes when the sun's out. So, you know, right. uh, uh, it's, just, it's just the fascination with the uniforms and the, yeah. and the equipment. As a child, it's just that little bit better than the British stuff, I think. So, Europe, so. Right. And is there some crossover with uh, a Desert Rats reenactment group? Uh, no, we just don't like them at all. No, we don't either. What? No, we don't. No, we don't. I mean, if, obviously, we, we do know other groups, uh, reenactment groups, and of course, um, if, we, if we were to, we, well, I'm sure we'd have a good, good chat and a chinwag. Yeah. A, a good chat and a chinwag? A good chat and a chinwag, yeah. Okay. Probably with the MG34. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It's good, yeah. yeah. North Africa. What, what happens in North Africa? Stays in North Africa. <laughs> okay. Serious business. Thank you. Now this reenactment group reenacts 1984 Cold War Europe, but why did you pick that date? Well, 1984 was a particular year of Exercise Lionheart. Now, Lionheart was the biggest operation the British Army and NATO had put on since the end of the Second World War. And right, now pay attention, this is Operation Lionheart. And now we are starting here, and we are to imagine that the Soviet bloc, uh, the Soviet bloc starting over here, has invaded all these yellow areas, and it's our job to push them back again. The year is 1984, and this is a map showing the biggest operation of Allied forces, NATO as it was then, and still is, um, since Normandy. And as the paper produced at the time says of Operation Lionheart, we're off. They mobilized pretty much as many people as they could. Territorials, people who had uh, recently left the army but were still available for call-up, uh, all the various regular armies, and it was an international NATO effort. They wanted to prove to the people over there that uh, NATO was still quite capable of resisting an attack. So, the operation imagined that this yellow area had been taken over by an invasion force of Soviets, and uh, this corridor, you can see, was where they pushed them back, and you can see lines here representing various stages of the operation. And, um, well, one imagines that this was at least reasonably successful in that in uh, 1985, for which followed 1984 quite closely, uh, the Soviets didn't try anything. So, the idea was to convince them that uh, the NATO still had it in it. It was a, sh a pure show of force and logistics to Soviet bloc forces that NATO had it and they could do it. They could mm -hmm. show the Eastern Bloc that we had, we, we had the force and the power to mobilise not just the army, the territorial army, the reserves and men who'd left in civilian life but were still on the list to be called up. And, and so in order to put on this show, those people actually had to be called up. They were called up from their civilian jobs. They got the, the phone call saying mobilise. They got to go to their local TA centre, be re-kitted out and go to go by the... Uh, all the trains and all the ferries that have been taken on by the army to get troops over to to France, uh, to, over to, to the Europe. Right. So, uh, was this considered a great jolly, or, or, or was it a bit of a, more of a bind? Well, when you're speaking to the, the various chaps who were on the exercise, some thought it was a fantastic show of force to the Soviet uh, bloc forces. Some of them were a bit annoyed they had to leave their jobs to go over to the, for this exercise, and some absolutely hated it. The original. Uh, the FBS film crews who reported mm -hmm. throughout the exercise show a, a wide array of uh, reactions to the actual <laughs> exercise. Oh, right. So, so one could say that never have so many men hung around doing so little but to such great effect. And it showed the top brass that they could do the job. Right. And so of the many weapons that were not used in anger uh, during that uh, operation, uh, this was one. What is it? Well, this is the MOBAT, or the Mobile Battalion Anti-Tank Gun. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was designed at the end of the Second World War with the idea that the Russian forces were going to copy the German forces and produce super tanks like the King Tiger with right. extra thick armour. Um, this uh, weapon originally came out as a bat with a huge armoured shield, was stripped down and made into the MOBAT, a mo mobile, mobile battalion anti-tank gun. Right. 
Also, there's a version called the Combat, and the most common version, which most of the old sweats will know, is the Wombat, the weapon of magnesium, which was a right. smaller, lightweight version, which couldn't be towed, but had to be pulled into a back of a Land Rover. All right, well, I can see there's rifling in the, in the front here. Now, uh, this is, I believe, is what sometimes is called a recoilless rifle. Yep, is that exactly. right? It's not a cannon, it's not, a, not an artillery piece, it's a recoilless rifle, it's an infantryman's weapon. Right, so this then uh, doesn't have to be on a massive uh, carriage with a massive spade dug into the ground behind it to take the massive recoil of a big gun uh, because somehow it, it deals with its own recoil. How does it do that? Well, the, the rounds are uh, very specific. They're designed with a blasting cap in the back, so mm -hmm. a percentage of the actual energy will go rearwards. And I was talking to many old gunners on, on the Mobats and, and on all the variations mm -hmm. that the back blast was just dangerous as the front end. Well, to, in order to counteract all the force going that way, you would have to have presumably an equal force going that way. An equal and positive force going rearwards. Up to 100 foot rearwards would be a back blast. Right, so uh, not to be used in confined spaces, and uh, if you are going to use this, uh, don't stand immediately behind it. <laughs> Uh, but it's, see, I see here, you seem to have a, a coaxial Bren gun. Yep, the, 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 uh, the, the Mobat has mm -hmm. a, uh, a coaxial Bren. This is the earlier Mark III, which is uh, the 303 version. The later right. ones had the Alpha 4, which was 7.62. And it was purely designed with tracer. It could be cocked by the number two of the gun and mm -hmm. fired by the gunner by a remote trigger on his side. He'd be looking through the sight, looking for tracer to hit the enemy armour. When that air trace was hitting the enemy armour, he'd fire the main ordnance, which is an electronic ignition. So this was perfectly matched ballistically to the main gun. Yep. If that hit, this hit. So, yep, they were sighted to each other and all zeroed in perfectly. Impressive. And I see that you've got the original optics surviving here. Yes, very luckily I was able to find some of the original optics for it. And parts for these are very hard to find. Oh, right, so you didn't get this all in one go. This is cobbled together of a several several survivors. No, I, luckily, this was recovered out of a field near Shropshire, and it was uh, been in there for a many, couple of years, and we restored it back to how it was. Hang on, it recovered from a field? So you're just saying that the army just sort of lost it? No, no, they, these were sold off. Um, this, I've talked to various other gunners. These were towed off in, in the very late 80s, early 90s for the decommissioning. The last time these were actually used in anger, the Wombats, mm -hmm. where they were actually taken down to Ascension during the Falklands War and used then. So that's a weapon which design dates from 1953 and been in service for over 30 years. So presumably it worked. It worked perfectly. The round itself, the Hesh, which is high explosive squashed head, yep. could punch through, well, the, re the reverberations from the explosion on the side of the tank could go up to 16 inches of armour. Right, so it hits the outside of the armour with such a shock wave that although the shell itself doesn't go through, the inside bits of the armour flake off and fly around on the it's inside of the vehicle. It's a cow splat method on the side of the tank. Nasty. <laughs> right, so here we are at the, uh, the breech end, and I can see this big fat tube here, which is uh, where all the bad news would come out at the back end. Yep, out of the back of Venturi. Yep, and uh, you told me that there was something uh, missing here. Yep, this is a fired shell. Originally, it would have had a, a, a Bakelite blasting disc in the back of here, mm -hmm. which when fired would come out the back also. This actually holds a percentage of the energy when it, the shell's fired. Right. Uh, so in order to get this in, I just push it in? Yep, use the flat of the hand and push it all the way home. Right. That's him. And close it, move with the levers. Okay. Get it in the ready to fire then position. Get it away from that. Yep. Number, Bang. Number one gunner would fire the Bren. See the tracer rounds, hit the electronic fire button. The signal will go through, through the electronic firing solenoids, which sends a pin down into the casing. Yep. Big bang, about 120 decibels, which is about the same as a jumbo jet going over your head. That's why most of the old gunners who fire this are deaf as a doornail. Oh <laughs> and doornails are famously <laughs> deaf. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, and now I just grab this and, and pull. And pull as hard as you can. And that'd be the casing out. Right, which would be scorching hot at this point. Scorching hot, normally they use asbestos gloves to take the casing and throw them away. Right, next one in, and on, and away you go. Right, so those are two of the reenactment societies here at Tank Fest 2017 in the Living History section, which, as you can see, is populated by many reenactment societies, uh, reenacting all sorts of periods and nationalities uh, from the tank using period. So, if you want to find out more about these, why don't you come along to Tank Fest 2018? <laughs>